Greetings again today in that name that's far above every name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We appreciate you that are present. We appreciate our visitors. May God bless you. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now, this is Preacher Edwards speaking. We're hoping today we can be a real inspiration to every one of you. And you in the radio listen audience, if you get on your phone and call a friend, have them to tune in and get this hour coming up, I feel we can be an inspiration to them. So we appreciate your presence and appreciate you listening today in the radio listen audience. I want you to turn to 2 Kings chapter 5, page 4, 26 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. If you have that Bible, I want you to be sure and turn there and keep it open. At 2 Kings chapter 5, I'll be pointing out several things from this chapter I want you to see. I was kind of grieved the other day. I turned the TV on to the Larry King show. So occasionally I look at it when they have something on there that's interesting or might learn something from pertaining to our nation or whatnot. And he had uh, Jimmy Carter on there. And Jimmy Carter was praising Gaddafi and down in America. He said Gaddafi was the little David and America was a big, uh, a mean Goliath. He didn't use it in those terms, a big overbearing Goliath. I don't remember the words he said, but he's comparing our nation, this great nation as being the old Goliath and Gaddafi, the little David with the stone. And I tell you, it made my blood boil. There's a man praising Gaddafi and downing this country. And this country honored him some time ago, being president for four years. And he's the jaybird that pointed three of those, uh, two of those uh, uh, three stooges, they're called judges, that changed the uh, all-day family conviction down there in southwest Georgia. And Jimmy Carter put three of those, two of those stooges on the beach. There's three of them. And there's 85,000 signatures went into Washington to get those three stooges impeached. And we haven't heard a thing from Washington. Our congressmen need to wake up and realize how the American people feel and those three so-called judges ought to be impeached, should have done a bit impeached for what they did in respect to overturn the conviction of the cold-blooded murders of the all-day family. Makes your blood boil. Down here in Greene County, one of these liberal crime-loving jaybirds overturned the death sentence of a man that took a vice president of the bank in his home and beat him up unmercifully and then robbed uh, the bank or had a part in it and overturned his conviction. I'm going to tell you now, these liberal, crooked, venal, crime-loving appeal court judges and others are going to face God one of these days. They're going to face a judge that won't be able to get around They'll have to answer to him. Now, don't misunderstand me. We have some good judges. We have some Christian judges. But, brother, we have some as crooked as a rattlesnake and they have to screw their britches on when they get up every morning. And if they crawl through a bale of fish hooks, they'd go through and wouldn't get stuck by not a word. they answer to the people. And they are largely responsible now. These crooked fellows like that are largely responsible for the crime way we have in America today. And they'll answer to God for it. Now, whether you like what I'm saying or not, makes no difference to me. I know what I believe. I have conviction. And I've learned a few things since I've sojourned, uh, since I discovered America many years ago. Now, I thank God for this great country. I thank God for the uh, great leaders we have. I thank God for men that stand for that which is right. But we have a lot of crooked boys in this country. I'll sell you out in a minute. And I'll tell you, I, it makes my blood boil. I want you to turn to 2 Kings 5. Remember, you can write in and get a list of my cassette tape. I have about 226 listed here. Tape number 216, everybody should get. And that is the Tongues and the Charismatic Movement. And these tape are $3 each. And write in to get a list and call for them by number or by title. And we'd be glad to send them to you. And that way, we keep our radio program on the air and have to take care of our operating expense. Now, my mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603, number. I'd like to hear from you next week. And I hope you're finding that place now in 2 Kings 5. Now, this tape today will be tape number 231. 
And the subject is seven ducks in a muddy pond. Now since it's Memorial Day, I'm going to deal with a great general, the great General MacArthur of his day. I want us to find out something about him. General MacArthur was one of the greatest generals that this nation's ever known anything about. Very few of them have ever lived in this land, and he was one of them. And we thank God for him. Yonder in New York some time ago, there's a man going to catch a plane to Boston. Went down and bought his ticket, and he purchased his ticket. They said, you'll be leaving at 2.20. He saw he had a little time to spare, so he began to walk around. And he noticed a set of scales. He thought he would go over and weigh himself, so he went over and inserted the coin in the scales, and there popped up his name. He said, your name is John Jones. You weigh 188 pounds, and you're waiting to go 220 to Boston. He thought that's awful strange. He walked around. He couldn't understand that thing knowing so much. And so he changed his hat and pulled it down over his face. He went back and inserted another coin in the machine. And then the fortune dropped down. It said, your name is still John Jones. You still weigh 188 pounds. And you're waiting to go 220 to Boston. Man, that puzzled him. He said, I can't understand how that thing knows so much. And he went into the restroom. He said, that thing's not going out to do me. I'll just go in and change clothes. He went in the men's room. He changed all of his clothes. He kind of ruffled up his hair. He turned his head on sideways. He went back out. He stepped on the scales. He inserted the coin. His fortune dropped down. He said, your name is still John Jones. You still weigh 188 pounds. You've just missed your 220 to Boston. All right. Second Kings chapter 5. Now, in order to conserve time, I'm going to read only one verse. Now, we have here a general of the Assyrian army that went into Israel and captured a little Jewish maiden and brought her back to his home to be a waitress for his wife, a servant there in the home. And this little Jewish maiden had become acquainted with Elisha, the great man of God. And so uh, this man, Naaman, had contracted a terrible disease known as leprosy. And she said, I would to God that he would go and see the prophet there in the uh, a Samaria, the prophet Elisha. That man of God could cure him of his leprosy. And she told Laman, uh, Naaman's wife, and Naaman's wife informed her husband, and he got to thinking about it, well, it would be good maybe if I win. And so he made plans to go, and he went to Samaria, and he went down to the shack of uh, Elisha. He lived in a little home down there near the river of Jordan. And then Elisha told him to go jump in the lake. In other words, he told him, said, you go down to Jordan and duck yourself seven times. Now, the river Jordan runs muddy many times during the year. And in those days, it overflowed quite, overflowed quite often. And there, no doubt, it was muddy and overflowing. And he said, you go and duck yourself seven times in muddy Jordan, and you will be healed. Now, in verse 14 of 2 Kings 5, then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like in the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Now here you have your seven ducks in a muddy pond. You have this great General Douglas MacArthur of his day ducking himself seven times in a muddy river. Seven ducks in a muddy pond, and he came out, his, his, his flesh as clean as a baby because he obeyed the men of God. Now, there's a few things I want to point out from this chapter here. You'll have to keep your Bible open because I'll point out the verses, and you can take a look at them as I point them out and see what they have to say. I want to notice, first of all, Naaman and his leprosy. He was a man that had a, a leprosy. In those days, he was incurable by human science and human efforts. No way to cure it. It meant sure death. Now, notice, first of all, he was a great general. He was a military genius. He is a great leader of his day, but the Bible says in verse 1, if you notice there, he was a leper. Leprosy is a type of sin in the Bible. Number 2, he was a wealthy man, but he was still a leper. In verse 5, his wealth did not cure him. It could not help him in this terrible time of illness, having leprosy. Number 3, this marred his happiness. Although he was a great military leader, had conquered many armies, done great wonders for Assyria, a very wealthy man. He was an unhappy man. I don't care how much money you have, how much land you may own, how many stocks and bonds you may have, 
Beloved, if you're sick, a sick individual, and you know you're soon going to leave the world, you can't be happy. Money cannot buy health in this manner. Money will not make you happy. Land, stocks, and bonds will not make you happy if you have a terminal illness. Now this man here, uh, this marred his happiness. He was a leper. Now according to the law of his country, he would soon be put on the outside of the city. They required that he had to get on the outside and there he had to keep himself at a distance from all human beings because he could not come near them. Lepsy will uh, mar your beauty and make you miserable. He may have been a handsome man, but this leprosy in his body would mar his beauty and make him miserable. Turbo was disease of leprosy in those days. No human cure. But you know there was a little maiden that worked in his home that he had captured over there around Jordan, over, over there uh, around Samaria, and had brought her back to his home in Assyria, and she knew somebody that could help him. There's always somebody that can give you a point or two that help you along the way that God may be using them just to say something, give you a phrase or sentence, a word or two that might help you. And she knew something about this man, Elisha, the prophet of God. Number two, I want you to notice this great general's mistakes. Naaman made some mistakes. He went to the wrong person in the right way in verse 6. He went to the king of Israel. Here's a king and sent him to the king of Israel. He went to the wrong person. She said for him to go to Elisha. But he went to the king of Israel. and went in the right way, but he went to the wrong individual. Now there's a right way to do things, but you can go to the wrong place to do it. Secondly, he went in the wrong spirit to the right person in verse 9. He went to Elisha. He went to the right person this time, but he went in the wrong spirit. He thought the king should have done something about it. He was a dignitary. He was a general. And surely the king of Israel would recognize that and do something about it, not send him down there beside the bank of the river of Jordan to a little old bald-headed prophet down there. He wanted the king to do something about it. He went anyway. He went in the wrong spirit to the right man. Number three, the word given was to receive. Verse 11, the man of God told him what to do, but he did not receive that information. He would not accept what the man requested. He did not want to do what the preacher told him to do in verse 11. It was to receive. Number four, he wanted an outward show of religion in verse 11. He wanted the man of God just to show outwardly a form of religion. Just come out and put your hands on my body, say a prayer for me, and then I'll be healed. He wanted an outward show. Many years ago here in the city of Athens, I'll not name the church, but it's one of the large churches in Athens, there was a woman there that attended that church regularly, and she wanted her husband to become a church member. And she begged him to come. He said, no, I won't. I'm not coming to church. I'll, I'll go to the Sunday school room, and, and I'll leave after Sunday school. But she said, I want you to come to the church. I want you to join the church. He said, no, I won't do that. And she talked to the preacher about it, and he had informed her that he might go ahead and join if the preacher would come down to the Sunday school room and take him in down there in the Sunday school room. But he had, had no idea. Uh, he never meant to attend the worship service. He didn't intend to go to the auditorium. Just come to the Sunday school room. And so the teachers, the, uh, the preacher said to the lady, said, yes, I'll be glad to go down and we'd accept him into the church membership down in the Sunday school room. And that they did. Now that was a compromise. Here this lost sinner wanted to become a member of the church but he did not want to come to the auditorium. He wanted to become a member down in the Sunday school room and knew nothing about God. And that old apostate pastor went down and accepted him in, an unsaved man, of course, down in the Sunday school room. Beloved, listen to me. Here's a man here that thought the preacher ought to come out and bow down, say a prayer, and get him healed. But he didn't do it. He didn't do it that way. He went out with your religion, but not so. He wanted to wash in the wrong rivers. Look at verse 12. Now when the preacher said, you go to the river of Jordan, and he knew something about that river. No doubt he'd crossed it in fighting many times. He knew it was a muddy river at this particular time of the year. And the preacher said, you go down to Jordan, you get in that river, and you duck yourself seven times, and you'll be healed. Oh, he didn't like the river of Jordan. He said, no, that's the wrong river. He said, I know some rivers back in uh, Assyria. That's far better rivers than the river of Jordan. And by the way, I've seen all three. I've seen the two in Assyria. I've seen the river Jordan many times. I've been baptized in the river of Jordan. But the rivers in Assyria are very beautiful. And he wanted to go back to the rivers in Assyria 
and duck himself there. The preacher said, no, sir. No, sir. You go to the river of Jordan. You go God's way or you don't get him. And in verse 11, he went away in a rage. It made him so angry. Why, he said, I wouldn't do that. I'm not going down to Jordan. I'm not sticking my feet in that muddy water. I'm not about to wait out there and duck myself in that muddy water. Who does that preacher think I am anyway? I'm a general. My name is Naaman. I'm the General Douglas MacArthur of Assyria. No, sir. He didn't recognize me as to what I am, and I'm not going to do it. And he became very, very angry. Number three, notice Naaman and his wrong thinking. Now he had some wrong thoughts here. He thought that God would be a respecter of persons. At any time people think God will be a respecter of persons because of their popularity, their political standard, their financial status, then they should have another thought coming because that one is dead wrong. When God looks down upon human beings, He has no respect of person. He sees the rich and the poor, the yellow, the black, the red, the white. He sees everybody just alike when He looks down upon this earth. And we cannot appease God. Beloved, we must come as we are, a poor, low sinner, regardless of your standing in the world. He thought God would respect Him because He was a general. Secondly, he thought money could buy grace. Look at verse 5. When he started on his trip, he said, I'm going to take some money, some silver and whatnot, and I'll go and I'll pay this man and he'll heal me of my leprosy. Dear soul, money can't buy grace. Money can't buy salvation. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can bring about salvation. He thought that he must do some great thing. Look at verse 13. He wanted to do something outstanding. If I could just do something outstanding... Then I'd be glad to do that. Did you know there's people in the world today, if you told them if they'd walk a mile, they could go to heaven when they die, they'd do it. If they thought they could, they'd do it. When you tell them all they need to do is repent and believe on Christ, then go to heaven when they die, they won't do that. They want to do something outwardly to have a part in their own salvation. Then number four, he thought his nobility should be respected in verse 11. He thought because he was an outstanding general, that ought to be respected. Now, God is no respecter of person. Down here, we respect great men. As I mentioned, General Douglas MacArthur. As I mentioned, um, uh, our president and other great men today, we respect them. Uh, but God Almighty looks on all of us alike when it comes to the matter of salvation. And then he thought he should be saved in a respectable manner. Verse 11. Why, well, he thought, now this, this preacher should take care of me in a respectable way. He ought to come out and bow down and say a prayer and maybe put his hands on me and heal me. He said, well, what he's telling me to do is ridiculous. He's telling me to go jump in the river. He's telling me to go down the Jordan and duck myself seven times in that muddy water. That's ridiculous. Surely the man don't know who I am. I'm the general. I'm the great leader of Assyria, the great general. And I, I, I'm not about to go down to that muddy river. And he thought the plan was just too simple in verse 12. That's too simple. I, I, I want to do something. Uh, just going down and, and merely ducking myself in water, that's too simple. Look what I have, leprosy. Well, that's too simple. That'll never do the job. A lot of people today, great sinners, and they think because they repent and believe on Jesus, that's too simple. They want to do something. They want to pull out their pocketbook. They want to do some extra work. They want to uh, do something in religious in the religious world in order to obtain recognition, but that it doesn't work that way. And then he thought uh, he knew of a better way in verse 12. I have a better way. And you'd be surprised today at the people in the world, when you begin to talk to them about the things of God, they got a better way. They, they know a better way to do it. They, they can do it their way. Uh, this is what I this is the way I do it, they say. This is my this is my religion. Beloved, we'll come God's way or we're going straight to hell as a martyr to the Lord. Jesus said, I'm all, there's only one way. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except by me. Now notice number four, how he tried to be a great sinner. He wanted to be a great sinner. You know you have a lot of people, although they're sinners, they want to be a great dignified sinner. He wanted to be regarded as a great man. Look at verse 1. Secondly, he wanted to go to a great king in verse 5. Uh, number three, he wanted to pay a great price. Look at verse 6. Number 13, he wanted to do a great thing. And then he wanted to have great respect, verse 11. He wanted to make a great show in verse 11. And he wanted to go to a great river in verse 12. Man, he wanted to be something great. He wanted to do it in a great way. He had his way mapped out. 
Then we come to number five, and that is how God humbled him. You know, you can't get people saved till you get them lost. A lot of people are lost and they don't know they're lost. When they find out they're lost, you might get them saved. You'd be surprised at sinners today. You've got to get them lost or you'll never get them saved. They're lost and don't know it. Now God humbled this man by saving him through a little captive maid in verses 2 and 3. This little Jewish girl, God used her to bring about his healing, to bring about his salvation. They're a little Jewish maid, if you please. And then secondly, by using his servants to persuade him in verse 13. Why he had some servants, they said, Sir, you ought to try. Sir, if he asks you to do some great thing, you'll do it. And he just barely asks you to go down and duck yourself in Jordan. Why, you ought to do that, sir. And his servants persuaded him to do that. Number three, by the prophet refusing to come out in verse 10. When he rode up there in his great carriage and from Elijah's little shack and and he thought the preacher had come out bowing down to the ground and, and walking out with his hands outstretched like a, like the Pope or something of that kind. And, and he thought, well, this preacher come running out, come bowing to me because he knows who I am. But that preacher didn't even get up out of his chair. He just stayed in, in his little house. He didn't come out. Didn't come out to meet him. He just sat in there and sent word out there, said, you go tell that fella to go jump in the lake. You go tell that fella to go down here to Muddy Jordan and duck himself seven times in that muddy water. The preacher didn't even come out, didn't even as much as get up out of his chair where he was seated. There he just stayed on the inside, he refused to come out, verse 10. And then by the ignominious method of cure, verse 10. While this man thought, well, now this is some sure way, some poor way to cure a man of leprosy. There to go jump in a river in muddy water. What's that got to do with my leprosy? That is some ignominious way to get me clean. Why he thought that was terrible. The very idea. If the man's a man of God. Why can't he just come out. And put a little healing salve on my body. Why can't he just come out. And, and touch me. And heal me. The very idea. That's ridiculous. Go and get in a muddy river. And duck myself seven times. That's terrible. And then the meanness of the river. Verses 10 and 12. This river here. Was a muddy. Trashy. Dirty river at this particular time. The meanness of this river. Why, well, he said, if the water was clear, it might make sense. If the water was clear, then it might even be dipped. But that's a muddy, dirty river at this particular time of the year. And he wants me to go down there and duck myself in a muddy, dirty, filthy river. Why, well, he said, uh, that, that's, that's ridiculous. I, I just can't do that. And then, by him going down under the water seven times... See, God is humbling this man. He thought, now, the very idea, why should I duck myself seven times? Why, if I went in that water one time, ought to be enough. One time in that muddy water, well, why go seven times? Seven is God's number of perfection. He didn't know that. Seven times, verse 14, God is humbling this man. God is getting this man to the place where God can save him and heal him. Then we come to thought number six, and that's some things he did right. Old Naaman finally came around to doing a few things right. Number one, he was a leper, and he knew it. He knew he was a leper. You'll never get a man saved unless he finds out he's a sinner. When he finds out he's a sinner, you have some hope of getting him saved. You've got multitudes and multitudes, they don't know they're sinners. Oh, they're going flying into heaven because they joined some church. They don't know they're sinners. Secondly, he heard of cleansing, and he sought it. He heard about it. He heard it could be cleansed as leprosy, and he did something about it. Number three, he disliked the treatment, but he tried it anyway. He didn't like the idea, but he tried it. He was immediately cleansed and confessed in verses 16 and 17. When he went down and ducked himself, he was cleansed immediately, and he confessed that. And then he was sincerely grateful and showed it in verses 15 and 16. Then number seven, notice the simplicity of this salvation. Nothing to do, that is nothing to do, just only go down to the river, duck under that water uh, seven times, and God will do the job. Verse 14. Nothing to pay. I'll take nothing, said the preacher in verse 16. You don't buy salvation. You don't buy the work of God. Just keep your money. Number three, nothing to brag about. Just the old muddy water of Jordan. Nothing to really brag about. Just go down and duck under water. Nothing to think. You know, he said, I thought. I thought in verse 11, but he didn't get paid for thinking at this particular time. You just go do what the preacher tells you to do. That's all you need to do. Let the preacher do the thinking for you. You do that, you'll be all right. And then there was pure grace, got to Naaman only. Now, he didn't heal everybody in Assyria that had leprosy. Just this man, 
This is the grace of God in Luke chapter 4 and verse 27. And many lepers were in Israel in this time and the time of the last of the prophet. And none of them were cleansed save Naaman the Syrian. There were many lepers in Assyria at this particular time. None of them were cleansed but this particular man Naaman. There you have the sovereignty act of God. There you have the grace of God Almighty. God saving power. Aren't you glad that God sought you out and God saved you? There's multitudes out here today lost on the road to hell. Many of them will go to hell. But God saved you. Aren't you glad about that? Uh, Dr. George Gardner tells this story. Many years ago he said he went to a little home out in the country where he's running a meeting in a little country church. And he and the pastor went to this man's home for lunch that day. And they were sitting at the table and he told the story about his neighbor. His neighbor lived down the road. His wife had died. He had one little child, a little daughter. And he did his best for his little daughter. Try to give her a good education and, and do what he could for her as she grew up. And then one night there's a meeting going on there in the country church. His little daughter went to the old-fashioned meeting. And she stood there under conviction. Her daddy went and he stood there and he watched her. And she began to cry. And he could see her trembling. And he saw the white of her knuckles as she held on to the pew to keep from falling under conviction. When he arrived home, he looked at his daughter. He said, Mary, you listen to me. Your mother died when you were small. And I've done my best to educate you. I've given you the best I can give you. I've done for you what I possibly could do as your father. And I want you to forget about this religious stuff. I noticed tonight that you started to go down to that altar. Don't you do that. Don't you dare to do that. If you go down to that altar, then I'm going to beat you. I'm going to whip you like you've never been whipped. You renounce that religious stuff right now. I want to make something out of you. She went to bed that night. She made up her mind. She said, oh God, oh God, don't bother me anymore. Oh God, don't convict me anymore. God, I don't want to know anything else about Jesus. I don't know anything about religion. I make up my mind right now. God, I'll go along with my father. Don't bother me anymore. About two weeks, a terrible fever struck that village, that little country uh, land there where they dwell. And the, she contracted the terrible disease. And she is on a dying bed. And they called for the doctor. The doctor came in and the doctor said to her daddy, said, she just has a matter of, of hours, if that much. She's leaving the world. She's dying. Her daddy got out on his knees. He said, Mary, Mary, call on God. Call on God. Ask God to do something for you. Ask God to save you, Mary. Won't you please? Won't you please ask God to save you, do something for you? She said, Daddy, I made up my mind a few nights ago to go with you. Instead of God. God hasn't spoke to me since. And she lost consciousness. And went out into eternity without God. Let's stand our feet. It's a dangerous thing. To steel yourself against the wooing power of the Holy Spirit. If God is speaking. You ought to obey the Lord. Our Father. I pray today as we give this invitation. To someone here Lord. That's not saved. Or backslidden. To someone that would like to join the church. If any reason come forward. I pray the Holy Spirit of God will convict their hearts that they might move forward in this invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we have some very special visitors with us here today at the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens. We have a man I met some 50 years ago in Morganton, North Carolina in the CCC camp, Brother Walter Smith, and he has with him his fine wife, Thelma. Uh, she grew up in that area. He married and brought her to Georgia. And they came over today with a good friend, Brother George Eller, and his wife from Tekoa. And I haven't seen this man in some uh, 48 years. And he did me a favor when I left camp, or just before I left camp. He loaned me $4. After I left camp, I didn't have the money to pay him back when I left, but after I left camp, I lost track of him and been owing, that, owing him that money for a long time. Here some uh, couple of years ago, I found out where he lived in Stockbridge, Georgia. I sent him the money. And that relieved me of that uh, burden and worry that I had on my heart because I owed him that money. And he's smiling real big about that. I just hope he frames it and keeps it. But anyway, I don't believe in owing people anything and not paying them. I always pay my just and honest debts. And we're glad to have uh, Walter and them with us today and George and his dear wife. We have also another boy in camp with us, another man, uh, James Ginn. He's one of our members. And Brother James is here quite often in the service. So it's a real honor to have uh, these dear people and visitors here at Northside. I do hope they'll soon come back and see us again. Having seen this 
couple of, and in some 48 years, a long, long time. And you can imagine how it thrills my heart to have them here in the service today. Brother George Eller and his wife come to pay us a visit quite often from Tekoa, and we appreciate that so very much. So we welcome all of them back to come and be with us as often as they can. Uh, it's a real joy and privilege to have them in the service here today. 